Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up this week, Doomsday edges closer, Megalodon is sized up by some scientists, and pterosaurs are a little bit sensitive. Starting off the news this week, the Thwaites Glacier in the Antarctic has been more thoroughly mapped in two studies published in the journal The Cryosphere, revealing that it's melting from the bottom far faster than previously believed. The amount of ice that this massive glacier, which is nearly the size of Great Britain, loses a year has increased by about 70 billion tonnes since the 1990s. This new information will allow scientists to more accurately model what the future looks like for these glaciers, as understanding how the glacier decreases at the moment can inform us about how it will decrease later. It's worth mentioning that one of the studies didn't just focus on the Thwaites Glacier, with the Croson and Dotson ice shells also being looked at. Next is a paper published this week in Nature, which has attempted to reconstruct the body dimensions of Megalodon. The study explains how previous efforts to determine its size have often only used the Great White Shark as a modern analogue, despite Megalodon very likely being distantly related to it. This study compares Megalodon to five different species of living shark, making morphological extrapolations to see what body dimensions the giant shark would have at different sizes, finding that a 16 meter long Megalodon would have a head about 4.65 meters long, a 1.62 meter tall dorsal fin and a tail about 3.85 meters high. And now over to Ben for some dinosaurs. Thanks Doug. Well, also in the news this last week is the very exciting publication of a new theropod dinosaur from the Lower Cretaceous of the Isle of Wight in England. Named Vacterovenator inopinatus, this dinosaur is only known from a few vertebrae, but they're distinct enough for this to be recognised as unique species. The dinosaur is classified as a mid-sized tetaneuron, but beyond this its affinity cannot be said for certain, as it displays characteristics seen in several different clades within tetaneuri. The neck and back vertebrae are notable for being highly pneumatic, filled with air spaces, and is actually now one of the youngest known non-avian theropods from the UK, helping to fill in a gap in this period of dinosaur evolution. And that's not the only new dinosaur published this week. We're also welcoming a new species of basal ornithopod from the Lower Cretaceous of China, Changmiania lianingensis. I won't say too much about this dinosaur here, as the fossils are so extraordinary that I've decided to do a whole video on them for this Sunday. And finally for this week is a very interesting paper that has found evidence for tactile feeding in pterosaurs. Foramina, small holes, in the jaws and faces of vertebrates are associated with nerves and sensory organs, and so can be indicative of feeding style. Pterosaurs have generally been thought of as mostly visual feeders, but this paper shows that the pterosaur Lonco Draco from the Lake Cretaceous of England actually has many small circular foramina near the end of its beak, in a pattern that seems to indicate tactile feeding through the use of many integumentary sensory microorgans, similar to what is seen in some living birds. However, Lonco Draco has a very differently shaped beak to the modern birds that feed in this way, so its feeding method is still speculative, but probably involved tactile feeding of invertebrates or fish in shallow bodies of water. It just adds to the mounting data showing how remarkably diverse pterosaurs were. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. That's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed it, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday.